Yeah, that's what I'm trying to get towards. Like, because if you imagine we have 100 million products. Do you have right? listeners to this podcast who are going to care about all this? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I'm glad to hear it. I'm yeah. really glad to hear it. Go ahead. A small subset of, of okay. humanity. Hello and welcome to the 167th episode of From Alpha to Omega. Today is Tuesday the 28th of September 2021 and I'm your host Tom O'Brien. This week we continue our discussion with Michael Albert where we take a deep dive into the Paracon planning model. Part 3 will be released today as a Patreon only episode so if you like that kind of thing head on over to the Patreon and throw me a few commie dollars. This week I have the new Patreon Oxy Hixo to thank. Okay, let's rejoin the discussion. Right, Michael, I would like to do a bit of a change in tack now and get into the nuts and bolts of the algorithm, if you don't mind. So this is the stuff based primarily out of this book, you know, your the political economic or participatory economics. Let me tell Where you a crazy story about that book, because you wouldn't be, you wouldn't have it, right? Except yeah. for a fluke. The fluke was uh, Robin and I wrote it, and we submitted it to Princeton. Princeton was, at the time, it may still be, I don't know, one of the two or three most uh, prestigious academic presses in the country. And we thought there was zero chance that you know it would happen. But through an accident of fate, Princeton sent the book to, as a reader, a guy named Herb Gintis, All right, who we yeah. both knew really well. And who was, you know, my faculty person, and I sort of went there with him. It's a long story, but at UMass Amherst. And so Herb gave it a raving review. And I think they probably didn't pay as much attention to it as they maybe should have. And they published it. Yeah, the, that, that well-known uh, bastion of, you know, socialist anarchist publications, Princeton University Press. So, right, like, where do I start here now? I've got a lot of questions here. Okay, do, do you want to give a quick overview, say, of, I know it's, you know, it's a, that's a hard job, but a, a kind of a, a, a general quick overview of the planning process. I know this is a very big topic to ask you. Yeah, like a, fi- a five minute bang, give it to people so they get their gist. So before we nail into it a bit more. Maybe I'll do it even, even quicker than that. Central planning is top down. It's got the authoritarian dynamic. Markets is decentralized, but it's got this competitive pressure and dynamic, which leads to accumulate and accumulate. That's Moses and the prophets. There, I I quoted Marx too. (laughs) I like that quote. So they both are horrible because they both introduce all kinds of problems, which we can talk about if you want to. But what then? And when we were doing this, there was a guy named Alec Nove who wrote a book that basically said nothing then. It's markets or it's central planning or it's a combination of the two, and that's all there is. Sort of like Margaret Thatcher, although that wasn't his intention. And our attitude was, screw that. We have to think about an alternative. So the way, what did we come up with? The picture was, you want workers contributing to the decision about what to produce, how to produce it, how much to produce. You want consumers, obviously, contributing to the decision not only about what they individually consume, but what they collectively consume. And somehow you have to have the input of both, right, sort of intersecting and affecting one another and arriving at, the word you used was a plan, and that's what economists call it, arriving at a plan, arriving at a conception of what will be produced and consumed. And so the picture that we had was, since we want workers to self-manage, they have to have a venue, and the venue is the workers' council. So workers' councils make proposals about their workplace. Consumers make proposals, in essence, about their own personal and collective neighborhood or larger area consumption. These proposals have to be communicated. And in light of the proposals, there has to be change. There, you know, it has to become evident that 
certain things have to change. The proposals are out of whack. That's that's a term Robin and I used when we were talking to each other. We called it a technical characteristic, out of whack, right? So supply and demand were out of whack. And so there would be a new round. So for us, participatory planning became an iterative process, meaning round, 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 you know, rounds of communication between consumers and workers' councils. It would be facilitated by some information massaging that was what we called an iterative facilitation board, and it would arrive at a plan. And you have to keep in mind that there's a budget constraint. In other words, there's what people can consume is limited by their income and what people produce. Now, it gets harder and harder. It gets more and more complicated the more and more layers that you give it to it. And in fact, in the book, No Bosses, that's the way I decided to describe it for the first time. I sort of described it layer by, you know, I described it a layer of detail, and then I added another layer, and then I added another layer. And so it almost became an iterative process describing the iterative, you know, the iterative planning system. So in the Paracon book, you you do like a, a kind of a, an imagined kind of a plan in it. You talk about somebody going to about doing it and how it would work. So one element in it is that, say, I am in the participatory economy. I have to, say, put forward what my consumption request is for next year, say. Like, on, on what level is that kind of necessary? It would seem to me, just from a kind of a usability kind of a point of view, that's a, a, a very onerous task for a person. And I would also go so far as to say that the kind of general aggregates in the economy will take care of the the noise, you know. So, like, it's probably a very good predictor for next year's consumption of the economy to look at last year's consumption. So, so on what level, like, on what level is that an unnecessary layer then? Well, here's the thing. First off, when I think about this, I want people to be participating in these decisions, right? And you want you want the decision to be rational. In other words, the the workers who are producing bicycles may say they want to produce this many bicycles. But it's people awful. only want this many, right? Well, that's no good. You don't want the workers to just go and produce a whole bunch of bicycles that are going to wind up in the ocean. Right? So you have to you have to have these things come into proximity of one another. Now, when you, when you say, yeah, but proposing your next year's consumption, that seems like, oh, ah, really? Well, you have to look at it another layer. You're not proposing every little thing that you're consuming. You're not proposing blue shirts, red shirts, and white shirts. You're not proposing, you know, fine detail. You're proposing in broad categories. And as you say, last year is a very good initial indicator. So I take my last year's consumption, and that's my initial proposal in essence. I'm not, I haven't made it yet. I tweak it now. Why do I tweak it? Well, I don't like some things as much as I did before, so I'm going to want somewhat less. I have other things. I have a new hobby, and I'm going to pursue that, et cetera, et cetera. But it's categories of stuff, right? Maybe it's even clothes. It's certainly not colors, right? As you say, and we can see it from what Amazon does, right? It's very easy to you to use collective data from the past to make reasonably good predictions about lots of things. Good enough for a plan. But you do want consumers to be in a position to express their desires for stuff, especially if it's new stuff, right? And you want that to sort of orient where the economy is going. So as producers of bicycles, if there's a sudden surge in bicycle desires, we want to know that, right? Because then we, we may have to have more people work in the plant or who, whatever we have to do, we have to do to accommodate and come to a final plan. So the, the answer to the question is no, you're not enumerating a list of a million products with a number next to each. Yes, you are indicating the broad strokes category changes of your consumption and also the collective consumption. So for instance, 
last year, let's say your let's say your neighborhood has two hundred people in it. Okay, sake of discussion. Last year, you all had some level of personal consumption, right? Why did you have the level you had? Well, we haven't talked about this too much, but it's because of your income. And for most of you, you work and your income is a function of how long you work, how hard you work, and the onerousness of the conditions under which you work. For some of you, your income is just average because you can't work. But so so you had last year's consumption. Now, suppose this year, your 200-person neighborhood decides that it wants to put in a pool, a neighborhood pool. So it's got to request that, right? That's got to be produced. So it has to put that into its request. And now, if your income is the same as it was last year, may or may not be, but let's say it was, right? Now, all of you are contributing to part of the purchase of that pool, so you're all getting a little bit less, and so you tweak your income, right? And these kinds of tweaks are manifested across the whole economy, and they lead to changes in the production proposals which in turn lead to changes in the consumption proposals. And after, you know, six or seven rounds, you're at a plan. So let me push back a little bit for you because we, you know, we're getting into the weeds here. So, uh, <laughs> so, um, so let me say that like, I, I feel like that when it comes to personal individual consumption, that you, by everybody reporting broad categories, you probably won't get anything better than an aggregate, than an aggregate would do. So, for example, something goes wrong in my shower. Next year, I end up having to spend two grand on fixing my sh- shower, right? And I didn't predict it, right? So, the, my so my prediction is not covered by that. And so, so the prediction of the aggregates from the previous year would be a better indicator than individual, say, consumption for a lot of things. For some things, yes. Yeah. So, for example, also, for instance, natural disasters. Yeah, right. precisely. Yeah. So, I mean, to take a big thing, nobody, when they sit and do their personal consumption, <laughs> yeah. is going to predict a natural disaster. <laughs> but we know. Nobody expects the Spanish Inquisition. But we know that there'll be a certain number of natural disasters in society. So, yeah. when you aggregate the personal predictions, you take into account what you know to be the case and you plan for it. Yeah, you're right. right. You're absolutely right. right. So I think there's a distinction. For me, it seems like that the person lets society know what they want by their general consumption, that society lets society knows by what it actually consumes, and that by making somebody say, well, this is going to be by consumption next year, is kind of a layer of extra it's like you're telling society twice what you want that the the kind of ever kind of the continuous nature of, of process of of, well, of of an economy it is continuous yeah like so this is like getting towards this problem of kind of problem of a continuous economy and a and a plan that's a, essentially a kind yeah, of a snapshot it's a little bit of both i mean it's there's no point in making believe or somebody could say look Whatever is planned goes, right? Tough shit if you missed, right? But no, that makes no sense. And your aggregate thing is true too. So for example, suppose our bicycle factory is producing so many bikes, right? I don't know, 100,000 bicycles, right? And the fact that one neighborhood goes up a little and one neighborhood goes down a little doesn't matter. So in other words, there's this, there's this plan based on what's been proposed and if somebody goes up them and somebody goes down, not so bad. If it offsets. If it doesn't offset, then the bike factory has to try and respond, or maybe it can't, in which case then it really is too bad. You have to wait, right? And that's the way it works. So, and when I say that the shirt demand is known and they extrapolate colors, right? Well, what else do they do? They produce. And the colors of shirts are out there in the stores, and they can also see the shirts disappearing, right? The the key thing here is in central planning, you've got some set of people deciding everything, okay? So that's bad because self-management is down the drain and a class division arises very quickly, right? That's the problem. In markets, the problem is that markets only work, in quotes, 
if you preserve the competitive dynamic. And so that means each actor is functioning sort of independent of and in isolation of and not even needing to know anything about anybody else, right? And we don't want that either, right? And and there are reasons why markets, maybe we should do this a little bit later, why markets generate a class division. But so, so you, you want a situation in which things are used, workplaces are not just squandering resources or squandering equipment, right? You don't want a situation where your economy has 50% of its productive capacity idle, right? Or is misusing stuff, you know? So you want something that pushes it toward a full-fledged efficiency. That means an efficiency that takes into account ecological effects, an efficiency that takes into account social effects, an efficiency that takes into account personal effects. Coal miners getting black lung disease, right? It doesn't count in a market system. It just doesn't, it's, it's irrelevant. It doesn't, doesn't register. We want it to register, right? Because we want a humane, just economy. So it's a longer discussion. How does all of this stuff happen in, a, in an iterative planning process? by workers and consumers' councils. And yeah, like, nobody should believe it based on our little discussion. Yeah, yeah. Like, I'm not making a, mar- I'm not making a market socialism argument. Let me make that perfectly clear. Like, so it's just a matter of, you know, it's, it's trying to get at, like, I, I think there's a distinction between, between personal consumption and, say, public consumption, where, like, those aggregates don't work the same way, say, like your example of the swimming pool, you know, it's a different thing. So like when it comes to participatory having to be involved, it it seemed to be absolutely 100% necessary for it to be when it's a public consumption. Do you know who Barbara Ehrenreich is? I mentioned her earlier. Yes, yeah, it was in your book. Yeah. the, the, uh, The origin of the modern day dealing with the third class. Okay, so she interviewed me and we had a long interaction. And it was sort of about this. And what she was saying was, look, I get planning for, you know, big stuff, industry, whatever. But I don't see why it has to be for my dress or my shoes. And I just don't see why we have to bother with it. And the problem is that you you have to realize that everything has a price, right? Everything is valued. Everything has some some congealed representation of the social costs and benefits associated with it. That's what we want to happen. That's what happens in participatory planning. But in markets, that doesn't happen. Why? Because the well-being of the worker doesn't come into effect. The the ecological implications don't come into effect, et cetera, et cetera. So when you say that we want to treat a subset of the economy for convenience, literally, for to speed up life, which is life. a perfectly reasonable thing, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. not saying there's anything wrong with that desire. But so to, to speed up the process of allocation and make it simpler and make it take less of our time, why don't we treat what you call personal consumer goods, right, based on market interaction, based on well, it is market interaction. It's, well, it's consumption it's, aggregates, like it's, you know. Yeah, but where do you get the aggregate from? Well, like I mean, like when you say market, like you know, as a Marxist, market means a whole lot of things, and not just buying a thing in the shop. So you know what I mean? That's like, true. And, That's you know, true. it's based on supply and de- based on demand. You know, essentially, you know, demand every, aggregates. Every allocation system has supply and demand. Right. Every allocation system, including central planning. Yeah. Every yeah. allocation piss system has people getting stuff. And budgets, that's not what markets are. Markets are having all that stuff determined by competition between buyers and sellers. Right. And here we don't have any competition. Yeah. So, so yeah, it's for me, it's like a a kind of an efficiency thing because what I can imagine it happening in real life, what happens to me or my whoever, my friends, whenever we're in a participatory economy and they'll say it comes out and they have to do their plan. They go, what did I put in last week? And they copy and paste you know, or last year, say, for example. And I think that's, I think that's... When Robin describes it, when Robin describes it, he says, look, if I was in this system, I would just take last year's consumption proposal and put it in. And I wouldn't even bother to look at it, right? And and you can do that. 
right? But if if it turns out that you can't fulfill it for yourself, you may have to make some changes. So let's say, for example, that the indicative price, that's what it's called, of something that you use a lot, uh, I don't know, meat, right? So you, you, you happen to like meat. You had a lot of meat this year. Suppose the indicative price of that rose this year significantly, right? Now, you're either going to have to lower the amount of meat that you're consuming, or you're not going to have enough left over for some other things that you want. Something's got to give, right? So do you want that to happen via some competition or via some mechanism of negotiated collective self-management? And that's the issue. And uh, I'll tell you, having, as this, let's say, participatory economics is becoming real, right? Insofar as it's becoming real, the new book sort of makes this clear, experience and, you know, the lessons of experience will affect the way it's implemented. And I don't even think it'll be implemented the same way in every instance. So So it may be, right, that people opt more toward saving time so your neighborhood consumption council might just all look at each other and say what the fuck and put in last last year's <laughs> consumption request right maybe they do because they just want to get on about doing something else now we should make clear here the way that people come to think that it would take too long is that they don't think about all the savings in time that are disappearing There's no longer an IRS. There's no longer class struggle. There's no longer time that's going to all of that. There's no longer trying to figure out how to make ends meet. There's no, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So a little time planning your your economic life is not such a big thing anymore. So that's interesting because that that clears up some of this stuff. Like, so you you first time you copy and paste and the second time yeah your meat comes back and it's doubled in price right or it's gone up 20 percent and then at that stage you have to make decisions with respect to your consumption next year like and in but, what but you also want to influence the workers right? okay but, because it may be that they should do something differently so i would come back now with a kind of a, a an argument for you uh then is like so why why do why does it have to come through like say for, so what am i trying to say here the the aggregates so the change in consumption patterns will be will be in the aggregate you know like the the the, the price of meat say in the society has gone up the consumption of meat goes down say why why can't you use uh what 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 is given by who that who is you who's doing it you can this is what central planners do no, yeah, I'm not making an argument for central planning, so don't get me wrong. Or market socialism, right? So I'm fully on board with... But you are. Well, no, I... I, I, I know you don't want to be. No, no, no. I know you think I am, right? I can feel it, <laughs> right? But I'm not. I'm kind of... I'm, I'm, I'm fundamentally making this kind of a cybernetic argument with you for, like, say, the real-time dynamic consumption and demand consumption will be a very, very good help with planning as opposed to, not even as opposed, that, that's the point I'm making, as opposed to true. a point that's for true. central planners. Yeah, That's true. So, so, once, so let's say we have a plan, okay? So we have, we, we've arrived at a plan. That, and, and so we'll call that plan on January 1st for the coming year, right? It's not the case that at December 31st, a year from now, we have implemented exactly what we did, what we planned. That's not the case at all, right? For lots of reasons, it will change. And how will the changes come about and be reacted to? Partly, like you say, partly from people going and getting things at distribution centers, revealing changing tastes or revealing a natural disaster or revealing whatever it reveals, right? But the initial plan will have been created in a, in a particular way. And then you want it the case, and you have to think about this too, you want it the case that the changes over the course of the year are not only possible, right, and not only done well, but that they're not done in a way which all of a sudden starts imposing a class division or or violating your values. And so, you know, I'm not really disagreeing with you too much. I'm saying that the logical extension of what you're saying, and you don't want to go there, I acknowledge, right, is 
that maybe we could do things with fewer steps and with fewer demands on the time of consumers and producers? And the answer to that is yes, we could, right? But if that's the only thing you value, and I know it's not for you, <laughs> but if it's the only thing you value, it leads toward either God. I give up control. Yeah, give up control. I'm deciding yeah. everything, right? Yeah. And the, and the results that come from that. Or it leads toward people think markets because they think that all the shopping that they do and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, they don't count that as time. But somehow they count it as time to actually make a decision or make a proposal. But in the future, that will be clarified greatly, right? And so we'll see. My, yeah, my real answer to you is we'll see. Yeah, like I, I, I fundamentally agree with the decentralized thing. I mean, no, no interest in making the argument for like you give it up. Yeah, you, you obviously, if you don't participate, it will, it will go, it'll go somewhere else. You know, somebody else will get control of the thing. But it's merely just a, a question of, I suppose, how the participation is done and what is, what is, what is, say, necessary. Because I, I, I feel as in, like, you know, a kind of an organic whole of an, e of an economy, like is like a living organism, like that there is a certain, kind, uh, a certain amount of continuity versus a discrete view of the economy, which should be built into a participatory approach. You know, that's my kind of... Angle. I don't know if that's just too woo-woo. Let me try it this way. Too woo-woo or what? Yeah, I, I, I don't think... Let, let's try it this way. Let's skip from, you know, shift over from consumption to production for a minute, okay? So what we're saying is that in the workplace, the workers' council is doing all this stuff, right? Is, make, is coming up with a proposal. Now, we're not saying that it doesn't use expertise of various kinds. It does, right? But the workers' council is deciding in a self-managing way what the proposal is. Now, that's going to take some time from the workers, right? You could, you could say, well, the economy is an organic thing, and we're going to arrive at a good solution, and so why don't we just have Joe, the best decision maker, do it quickly? And I think your response will be, because I think Joe will become a schmuck and I want everybody involved because it is it makes work what Mark said in that quote. It makes work part of life and a fulfillment of our life capacities for us to take responsibility for it and to have a say over it, et cetera, et cetera. And I agree with you. And so that's the way we would do it. I suppose a workers' council and a participatory economy could decide internally, right? Eh, let's let Joe do it, right? We've got participatory planning. We've got these balanced job complexes. We've got equitable income distribution. And we haven't done in detail any of these things, but we've got all that. So let's let Joe do it. He's really good at it. Fuck it. We, we get a little more time to do something else. I don't think they will. So in other words, would you need a law to prevent that? I don't think so right? I don't think that people would decide to do that. Now, on the other hand, if Joe has a position that gives him confidence and skills and information and everybody else or most other people don't, then it will happen. But otherwise, it won't. Now, go back to the consumption side. And I, I don't think you're hearing the, the agreeableness of, of what I'm saying. I'm saying, look, if the Consumers Council decides that it just wants to put in because it, it, it aggregates all of its members, right? So when all of its members make a budget proposal, the Consumers Council aggregates it. The whole economy doesn't care about each hundred, right? It cares about the aggregate for the whole neighborhood. So the Consumer Council decides, let's just put in last year's aggregate. Nobody pay any attention to it. Screw it. I don't think they'll do that. I, for the same exact reason, basically that it's their lives and they should have a say in it and they should participate in the thing. But you also want speed and efficiency. And what the actual breakdown will be, there's no point in arguing about now, right? We're going we're gonna to see what emerges probably differently in different cultures, right. different countries, right? But the key thing is you don't have central planning, you don't have markets, you do have 
self-managing by the workers and consumers councils. That's the essence. Okay, so n- next up, uh, <laughs> sorry for this, Michael. And right, that's okay. No problem. Yeah. No, your questions are really good, um, and, next- and your concerns are valid. I don't mean to say that you're just asking good questions. Your concerns are valid too, at least in my opinion. <laughs> okay. Let me get now. We're going to get into some hardcore stuff here, right? We're going to get into into the mathematical model that you built up in the book, which you call the FMPE. So that's the why is it called? What's it called? FM for let, let, Let's just Formal clarify model. one thing. Yes, the book that you're using is. Do you have you got it there? Yeah. Check the copyright date. Uh, it's about ninety two. Oh, ninety two. It's probably an old one. Let me see here. Okay, it's uh, uh ninety one. Yeah. Okay, so it's thirty years ago. Okay, I have trouble remembering yesterday. Okay, all right. right. So if you're going to ask me to tell you what some <laughs> abbreviation means, or whatever, no, 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 not that. Also, things have changed. Yeah. Okay. No, it's going. It's much broader. It's a fundamental point. Okay. okay good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So in, in 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 this in this book, let me see if this if you think this is a fair comment in the book. You're kind of. It seems like you're taking on two bunches of people. You're taking on the Soviet planners. Right, it's probably written just before the fall of the Soviet Union. Right, it reads like you're taking on the Soviet planners, and it also reads like you're taking on the neoclassical economists. Is that a fair take? Sure. Yeah. 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 And so that seems that the argument is really with the these kind of people, the planners, and you know the Princeton economists or whatever. Well, one other thing. Yeah. At the same time that that book came out, there was another book which South End Press, a left publisher, published. And the the other book was called, I'll have to remember it, but uh, I told you, I can't remember anything. I can't remember the title (laughs) of the book. So, but the point is that the second book, right, was written for essentially the left and normal folks, not for central planning inclined people, not for market inclined people, but for new left graduates, so to speak, right, from that period. And it was written in totally plain language as as accessibly as we could, et cetera, et cetera. And this this distinction still exists, just so you know. I mean, it seems like you've got plenty of time. So let me tell you, the, the book that I just did called No Bosses, right, is sort of like that popular book all the way back 30 years ago. It's written trying, hoping to reach at the most, most optimistically, right, Sanders supporters, Black Lives Matter, you know, and on and on. People who are concerned about the current state of affairs, and of course, people who are already anti capitalist. Um, And so it's written as accessibly as I could. At the same time, Robin has just completed a book, and it's called, I don't remember the name of that either, but it's basically a book about planning, right? In Routledge, and that's written for economists, literally for economists. And I would not recommend it for a non economist to try and read it. Unless they want to learn a lot of jargon and equations and all the rest of it. Yeah. And so so that division was there 30 years ago, and it's there now. Cool. Yeah. So let, let me get into this. So we kind of, for the listeners, then, there's a kind of a setup, a kind of a, a series of matrix equations, a kind of a model for the economy. So you have your capital inputs, your production levels, your labor inputs, uh, the available labor inputs, all of these things okay and we're going to try and solve for this vector called p which is solve the prices that will balance this big equation right okay so we're trying to solve for the prices that will balance all these consumption and production stuff okay subject to a few constraints like uh we want to get as much like social value of output given our inputs you know we want to get as much value, net value. So we set up this big equation. But in, in there, you have a vector called V. Okay, we're getting technical now. This is defined as a, ro- <laughs> a, a row vector of relative social values of produced goods. Okay, so this is like, I'm a Marxist, right? So this is my problem with the, the model, is that you have a, a basically a kind of a subjective theory of value built into this model? Do you think that's a fair point? Um, I don't know what you mean by that, but let's, let's I'll, I'll clarify. Do you want me to clarify? I don't believe in the labor theory of value. Oh, I know, yeah, I know you don't. I, well, but, I, I think you don't, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but 
the reality is that participatory economy is probably the only economy that anybody has ever come up with in which the income of people actually is a function of only how long they work, how hard they work, and the onerousness of the conditions under which they work. But the value of products, right, is not something that is simply a function of, I don't know, how many labor hours are embodied in them. That's just not, I mean, it's not. It, what, and what does determine it? When you say subjective, I think you mean, I'm guessing, you mean, well, the value of stuff is really determined by the fact that people value the stuff. And that's correct. That is to say, LeBron James's basketball skills, right? What determines the value of the N hours that he plays basketball and people watch on TV? Well, it's not how many hours he worked. It isn't anything like that. It's how much people fucking value it. It's, right, but... But like right. that, like it's not a commodity. It's not a commodity in the same sense as, say, like a mango or a say a, a what a mango. <laughs> He's not a commodity like a tin of beans, a mango, a bicycle. A bicycle. A bicycle. Yeah, it's a special kind of there monopoly only, position. There, there are very restrictive conditions under which certain kinds of value apply. Right? I mean, the value of a bicycle. Let's say it has so much labor time embodied in it yes okay, okay. so suppose you produce ten thousand of them and suppose now instead of ten thousand you produce fifty thousand and let's say the labor time embodied in each bicycle doesn't change a whit but it could be that the price changes in fact the price could go to zero because your parade is too many of them uh, so it yes. has to be socially valued but that's a that... phrase that comes up over and over again in participatory economics so right so yeah, but I, I think that, like, you know, uh, so we fundamentally disagree here, I think, because I would say to you that, like, you know, you know, that's a supply and demand issue from a Marxist point of view that would change the price, but not the, you know, a, a product only has value if it's if it's socially desired. Yeah. So I, I can I can do a lot of work to create something that's got no social value. No one wants to buy it. So it, go, it has got zero value. And, right. and we have supply and demand. But if we abstract away from supply and demand from a Marxist point of view, I would be able to say this mango has one one hour in it. This apple has 25 minutes in it. This peanut has uh, two and seconds in it. I'm telling you that that's virtually meaningless. OK, but so so what what I'm trying to see is get towards here is that like that the, the prices that you have here that you solve for are a function of all of these inputs one of them being this like subjective uh, ranking of things and so like i find it very difficult how how like think about the modern economy we've got a, a billion pro uh, who knows probably over a billion products right no but millions with the hundreds of millions of products at this stage. maybe hundreds of millions. yeah They're yeah not a, 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 well it doesn't matter we got yeah, a lot of matter. Pro yeah, okay. products we got we got a lot we got a shit ton got of a products. Shit load of products okay. right Okay. OK, how do you subjectively rank, say, one type of button versus another type of button with a different color or a button versus some glitter? You see, I think you end up in real problems with respect to yeah, this, this V. Okay, so here we do disagree. OK, so yeah. that's what participatory planning is all about. The answer to the question is the participatory plan arrives at, it, it goes through rounds, right? There are indicative prices. When the plan is finished, you have a price. When the year is finished, you have a real price. That's exactly the same with markets and central planning in one sense. If you want to ask what the price of something is in markets, you know, there's a momentary price. And then there's a sort of the price that that's impossible. Markets are just so ridiculous. I don't even want to yeah, get yeah. into it. Um, yeah, but in participatory planning, the price that you arrive at is very much a function of the planning process, the negotiation process, which, what are the factors? Well, partly it's the, the means of production, partly it's the tools you have, partly it's the workers' capacities, and partly it's what people want and what people are willing to use some of their income to get. And, and these things 
it's called the general equilibrium system. It's, you know, everything affects everything else. And to say, now, now you can come along and say, yeah, but, but we can figure out how much labor is in everything. Right. Well, aside right. from the fact that you can't, let's say we could. Well, it's in, it's in the model. It's in the model. Your, la- your labor inputs are in there in the model. Yeah, because they yeah, but then you have to do the labor inputs into every every imp, every resource every right. et cetera et cetera et cetera. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So the point is, let's say you can do that. So let's say you can say the embodied labor in this product is this much, and that product is that much, and so on and so forth. Okay, you can do that, and then if you want to, you can put that number where the number is average labor hours, whatever you have to figure out what that means, all right? But now you can put that number on the, on the thing, you attach right. to it. Yeah, yeah. And what I would say is that you've accomplished almost nothing. Something, but not very much, right? <laughs> Whereas if you go through a process which enables you to arrive at a plan for what will be produced and consumed in what quantities, right? You, you've arrived at something very valuable. When a central planner does that, right? When a central planner does that, it's ironic. What actually happens is you figure out the whole plan, right? And then you calculate from that the prices because the whole plan sort of determines the prices. Same thing for markets. You go through markets, you do everything, and you get the numbers of inputs and outputs of everything. Now you can calculate the prices, the real price that pertained. And it's it's uh, sort of similar with participatory planning. It's just that in participatory planning, it's self-management and it's without classes and it's with incomes that are equitable and so on and so forth. So the big differences are multiple. They're, you know, they're, they come from lots of, of factors, like what income people get. So, like, let me push back then in here a bit. Like, I'm enjoying this. I'm enjoying this, Michael. Uh, so, <laughs> so you like because you have an iterative process, right? But you also have a kind of a mathematical algorithm trying to solve these no. matrix. No, right. no, no, no. Um, let me let me explain something. Imagine a a, ca- a bourgeois economist, right, is going to understand the U.S. economy. So, what does this bourgeois economist do? Well, the economy is here. You know, look out the window. There's the economy. So the economy is here. You can't describe every single thing that happens. It's ridiculous, right? So what do you do? Well, you abstract. And the way you abstract is that you make certain assumptions. And just suppose you want to do the gravity of the sun on a rocket that we shoot off. You also abstract. You can't do the perfect shape of the sun. You make believe that all its mass is at a point, right? That's not true. It's a lie. Right? We all know but, it's flat. We all know okay. it's flat. Yeah, okay. It's a, it's a good, it's an abstraction, right? In which you simplify things so you can calculate. Okay. So that's what the physicist does pretty much all the time, right? In any practical situation. And it's, so an economist does that too. And the economist makes various kinds of assumptions about the actors, the people, about the material things and so on and so forth. And they come up with a bunch of equations. And when the, when the straight economist does that, right, they then look at those equations and they describe the properties of those equations, right? And they say those properties hold for the economy. Now, that'll be true if the abstractions were really good, right? So when the physicist says how the ship will be moved by the sun's gravitation, even though they assumed that the sun was at a point, it's a good abstraction, they get it right. When the mainstream economist makes assumptions about the economy, and then, you know, they get it wrong. Why? It's not because they do the math wrong. They're smart, right? It's nothing like that. It's because the abstractions don't work. But they prove to be useful because the economic model comes up with the model comes up with various claims about the reality, like it's efficient. It doesn't waste anything. In the United States, roughly 40% of food is wasted, right? But nonetheless, the economist tells us nothing is wasted. It's ludicrous. But but it has the aura of, of truth because of the equations and so on. 
Now I'm actually getting someplace because you, 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 <laughs> you, I promise, I promise. You pointed out something very astute earlier. You said that the book, the Princeton book, was partly addressed to central planners and market economists, right? And what was it doing? It was taking essentially the economic model because we don't have it outside, right? That's a big difference. We don't have it outside. So it was taking the model that was in that other popular book and it was abstracting from it to make some equations. And honestly, what we were doing, actually Robin and I might have been a little different in this, but I felt what we were doing is we were making economists, I mean, we're making abstractions that economists had to accept, right? Because because they were at least as legitimate as the assumptions that they make. Right, you were taking them on their own ideological kind of space. Right, and, and we were creating equations that were logical and we're, stu- we're not stupid either, right? And our equations showed that our model, assuming the abstractions were really good, right, was actually superior to the world as evidenced by their model of the world. You understand what I'm saying? There's the world, there's their equations and model of the world. There's our verbal description of a new system and our abstracted equations. And our abstracted equations demonstrated it to be more efficient as well as more equitable, et cetera, et cetera, than theirs. And that was what we were trying to do in that book. Now, I would never try and do that again because I just think it's who cares, right? It's not my agenda. Robin still believes in, in making those kinds of arguments, I think. For me, it's different. In other words, I would not want somebody to, to think about participatory planning as this abstracted image. I would want somebody to think about it as what's described in No Bosses. Right. Right. But but like you say, we do the, all the plans. See, I, I sit there, I put in my consumption plan. Our workers council put in our consumption plan and all the different workers council, all the consumption plans, they come through. So there's obviously these big amounts of information and mm-hmm. to crank out these indicative prices that is still done in some kind of algorithmic fashion. Like it's it's uh, uh, like I mean, algorithm is a technical term. Yeah, it, it, it is the case, right, that what you described, individuals make consumer proposals. The consumer proposals are aggregated together into neighborhood consumption, et cetera, et cetera. Workplaces make workplace proposals, right? Those are aggregated into industry proposals and then the whole economy. Now you compare the desires for consumption to the proposals for production, and they deviate. Right. And and hopefully you actually want it to be the case because you want people to expressing what they want. Right. So you would like it to be the case that people have expressed what they want and what they want should be more than people are quickly ready to produce. Right. They should be sort of overachieving and the producers should be sort of kind of, you know, a little less. All right. But anyway, whatever they are, you're correct now and you are getting into the nitty gritty that. You want to communicate to the workplace and to communicate to the consumers' councils, right, information based on this first iteration and and later iterations this repeats. So information based on the first iteration. And what kind of information do you want to convey to them? Well, you want to convey an indication of changes in prices, right? That's one of the very important things. You might also want to convey some qualitative information. Can there's I add- more on this in the book. But I- here's the thing that when you say an algorithm, right? In other words, you're saying basically, if we want to make this as simple as possible, the Iteration Facilitation Board should have a simple rule. And they can. Oh, they yeah. can have such a simple rule as the following. If demand is over supply or supply is over demand, right? Move it in your predicted indicative price in the following way. Right. It can be utterly mechanical. In fact, it can be so mechanical that it can be carried out by a computer. Right. Yeah. So like and the I'm, whole system still works. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to get towards. Like because if you imagine we have a hundred million products. Do you have right? listeners to this podcast who are gonna care about all this? Oh absolutely. <laughs> 
I'm Good. glad to hear it. I'm yeah. really glad to hear it. Go ahead. <laughs> On this episode, you heard the theme tune The Order of the Pharaonic Jesters and Night of the Purple Moon by Sun Ra and his orchestra. Thank you for listening and please join me for the next episode of From Alpha to Omega. This show is a member of the Emancipation Network, a Marxist podcast research collective. Make sure to check out our network sister podcasts General Intellect Unit, Jumpsuit Utopia, Mortal Science, and Swampside Chats. <laughs>